Lizzie brought it home last Monday. It was a tiny little thing, probably about five or six pounds, with light plastic paint on its skin and cloudy blue eyes. It looked like it had been used by the school ever since the early 70s, to be honest. Like, it had been thrown around and abused a few too many times by negligent kids. Actually, didn't even know until I had heard her humming a nursery rhyme in her room. She was sitting on the edge of her bed, rocking the toy back and forth. What is that? I asked casually. This is Georgia, she said, proudly, showing me the doll. Huh. I didn't even know that your school was doing this sort of assignment, I said. I thought the poor thing needed a good cleaning. Perhaps some fresh clothes and batteries, too, but I didn't want to damage any school property. I have to keep her for the next two weeks, Lizzie explained. Suddenly the doll began to simulate a baby crying, and she snatched it back from me and started to soothe it with another lullaby. I shook my head in mild amusement. With that sort of attitude, I'm sure that you'll get a great grade, I told her. I went to do laundry, thinking nothing of the whole situation. At dinner, though, Lizzie insisted on bringing the doll to the table and had it in a makeshift bed to keep it calm. I heard the doll make strange coo noises and commented, Is that, like, the last one they had? Seems like it's malfunctioning a bit. Don't treat Georgia differently, my daughter shouted. I raised my hands defensively and looked down at the doll, noticing that at least she had gotten it some nicer clothes. Uh, so, how often do you have to feed her? I asked, chomping on my stick. As often as she needs. Don't worry, I can handle it, Lizzie said as she checked on the doll. At least she was taking the assignment seriously. Soon, though, I became concerned. I heard the thing wail in the middle of the night, and instinct took over me to go and shut it down. Instead, I found Liz up, tending to its needs. She would rock it to sleep or find a way to feed it. The strange doll cooing again, electronically, as she did. You need to get some sleep. Let it cry for a little bit, I told her. That wouldn't be the right thing to do as her mother, Liz said sternly. Is it going to give you a bad grade if you don't feed it at once? I countered. Stop being so insensitive. It's just a baby, Liz said, as she went to keep the doll quiet again. I was starting to lose my temper, so we, we'd been up six times already that night. It's a fucking doll, Lizzie. Quit acting like a child. Just turn the thing off so we can get some sleep. The doll cried louder and my daughter shouted, Is that how you treated me when I was a child? Just shut me up and then make it all go away? This is ridiculous. Give me that thing, I said, as I tried to reach for it. She slapped my hand away and pushed me out of her room, locking the door. I didn't ask for your help. I can handle Georgia all on my own. I sighed, realizing she couldn't be reasoned with, and just decided to drop it. I've had enough trouble getting her to cooperate ever since her mother walked out on us. I didn't need her to turn on me and think I was the bad guy. Instead, I went downstairs to get some sleep, trying to push aside my irritation and concern for her obsession with the doll. But things gradually got worse as the days continued. Lizzie would be monitoring the strange doll almost night and day to a feverish extent. She refused to shower because she didn't want to be away from it. She also didn't like anyone else coming close to it. This is my baby. I can take care of her one day, she shouted to a friend who came by to check on her. The friend confided in me that Lizzie took it to all of her classes at school, going so far as to attempt to breastfeed the doll during a lunch period before a teacher stopped her. This was what made me finally decide to get my daughter to the doctor herself, in case of possible issues from the attachment to the doll. I didn't want to think she was having any kind of breakdown, but... Other explanations were beginning to run dry. It's a checkup for Georgia, I lied, when we got in the car. I stared in the back seat toward my young 12-year-old daughter and the doll that seemed to have gotten bigger, as if really was being nourished somehow. Its skin was brighter, its hair was thicker, its eyes were shinier too. What the fuck? Dad, watch out! Lizzie shouted. I slammed on the brakes to avoid traffic, and her doll toppled over. She immediately began to chew me out, quickly strapping the doll in. You could have hurt her! What's wrong with you? She screamed. I clenched the steering wheel and held my anger back. I needed to see if she was alright before I started dealing with this doll. 
We got to the doctor, as I promised, and I let the physician pretend to check the doll first. He showed this concerned look on his face when I explained the situation, and after insisting that Lizzie be examined separately, he pulled me aside for a talk. Has she been dealing with any other issues lately? Habits that seem out of place? Do you feel that she's coping well uh, mentally? He asked. It only started when the doll came home. Honestly, the thing freaks me out, I admitted. Liz was so cooperative with the exam, perhaps in an effort to reunite with Georgia faster, that she was back in the room in less than five minutes. It's definitely one of the most lifelike dolls I've ever seen, the doctor admitted. Yeah, I noticed that too. In fact, for the first time, I noticed the doll's eyes were blinking. Had it done that before? Do you suppose I should just get rid of it? I asked. How long is the assignment meant to last? The doctor inquired. One more week. I'm not sure I can handle her losing touch with reality or getting worse for that long, I admitted. I know that you would want the best for Liz, so my initial recommendation would be to agree. However, given that whatever she is dealing with seems to be tied up with this doll, it's likely a better idea to just let it slide. Once the assignment has come to an end, we can reevaluate everything. That seemed like a logical idea, so on the way home, I tried to focus on Georgia and what would make Liz happy. Still, I needed to think about long-term stability here. So, have you thought about what you might want to do once your assignment's over? Uh, will they let you keep the doll? I asked. You lied to me about the doctor. Are you trying to separate me from my baby? I won't give her up, you know, my daughter said. You can't steal her from the school, I told her. She belongs to me. They wouldn't understand. I can raise her, Lizzie shouted. I slammed on my brakes. Enough was enough. Okay, I'm tired of these games. You are old enough to stop playing pretend, I said, reaching back to grab the doll. Hey, she shouted. I took it from her. The thing crying and shrieking as I placed it in the passenger seat and drove home. She tried to climb up to grab the doll back. Liz, you need to calm down or we will get in a wreck, I shouted. I was veering off the road as she clawed at my arm, and the doll cried even louder, and then my phone rang. I was temporarily distracted. An oncoming car was about to collide with us. I managed to avoid it at the last minute, swerving towards our driveway and slamming on the brakes. Lizzie, God damn it! we almost died because of the damn doll, I said, getting ready to trash it. She grabbed me by the arm, forcibly pushing me to the ground, and took her doll into the house, crying as she went. I resolved then and there to dispose of the doll that night when she was asleep. I watched her the rest of the night. The strange doll always in her arms. She would sing to it, cradle it, even tried to breastfeed it once again, just like her friend had said. It was... It was mortifying to watch her slip into this... this fever dream. What's wrong with you? It's just a doll! I tried to tell her before she showered, but she had this glow about her that told me I couldn't just shatter the delusion. She was mesmerized by the idea of, of motherhood. I was convinced that my sweet girl had officially lost touch with reality and I simply had to take drastic measures. It wasn't going to be easy for her, but it was for the best. I waited until she was out of it, even making soft snoring sounds, and then I waited to be sure that the doll wouldn't make any sounds of its own. I noticed that the more that Lizzie had cradled it, the more happy it seemed. Content. Was it possible that this inanimate object was really adapting to the love that my daughter showed? I shook the thought away and stepped into her darkened room. She had placed the doll into what looked like a makeshift crib, even with stuffed animals included by its side, and I carefully walked across the carpet, staring down at this lifeless thing, trying to not be freaked out by how very human it seemed to look now. Lizzie was really making this doll feel like it was it was real. Sorry about this, I whispered to my daughter as I picked up the doll. Slowly, its eyes opened and we stared at each other for a long time. Was I looking at just a doll or... Or something more sinister... Abruptly, it started to cry. Lizzie jumped up and turned her light on, glaring at me. 
You're trying to take her from me, she screamed. The doll cried louder. I had lost this fight, but I didn't want to give up. It's time to wake up and face reality. This thing is changing you, I shouted. You don't understand. I need her, Lizzie screamed, grabbing the doll. Get out of my room, Lizzie. I'm just trying to look out for you, I said, as she softly cradled the doll. And I swear I saw it rotate its head and look at me. Maybe I did need some sleep. I threw up my hands and defeat as the doll made soft cooing noises, this time Lizzie placing it in the bed beside her. As I left the room, I swear I heard the thing giggle. What the hell? I didn't get much sleep that night. I'm too distraught over what I thought was a break in reality. There was no way this could be happening. But it simply was. The only thing that helped me get any sleep was to think that the day after was the day Lizzie's assignment would be over. We could finally be free of this weird doll. And when morning came, I got downstairs. I fully expected to see her fighting tooth and nail to keep the doll. And to my surprise, she was still in bed, apparently not feeling good. I'm sorry that we fought, she said as I checked her fever. And then I checked the room. Realizing I couldn't find the doll. Lizzie, did you hide it? Where is that doll? Where's Georgia? I asked as I frantically checked every nook and cranny. I really didn't want to fight to get rid of the thing. Dad, what are you talking about? She whispered. She pulled the covers back and touched her belly, rubbing it gently. Georgia's right here. I glared at her. And then realized she was serious about this delusion as well. My daughter was officially gone from sanity. I tried to hold back tears. My phone buzzed. Time for me to get ready to work. We're going to have a long, hard discussion about this whole mess later. Do you understand? I said. I didn't know what to do about her playing this game to the bitter end, but I decided to go ahead and drive over to the school and pay the fee for the doll. My phone buzzed again on the drive over. It was a clinic. I let it go to voicemail as I found a parking spot. I told the secretary who I was, listening as the clinic's message told me the strangest, most chilling news. We need you to bring Lizzie back in. The reports don't make sense of a girl her age. Has she ever been sexually active? I called them back immediately, trying to focus my attention on the phone and on the school official. Uh, I'm sorry, why did you say you were here? She asked politely. My daughter Elizabeth, she lost one of the dolls that you use here for practice to teach about motherhood. I came here to pay for it. Her teacher will know about the assignment. The clinic finally answered the phone. What do you mean when you left the voicemail? I asked, clenching the phone harder. Lizzie's teacher was called to the front of the school as the clinic explained. Although we weren't sure how it's possible, it seems your daughter is... is... pregnant. My body froze in horror. The teacher and the secretary were telling me something important. I didn't... I didn't hear them until they broke me from... from the reverie. You seem distraught. Is everything okay with Liz? The teacher asked me. I swallowed a gulp of air, my hands sweaty and shaking. Where exactly did you guys get that practice doll from? I asked. Both of them looked at me in confusion. My whole world ended with four simple words. What doll? What assignment? Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I want to tell you thank you so much for watching tonight's video or listening to tonight's episode of the podcast. I really appreciate it, and anytime you guys give me a subscribe or a follow or a like or a comment or literally just a watch, I can't thank you enough for it because you're the reason I keep making episodes and you guys are the reason that I love horror as much as I do. It's the middle of summer, and I'm sure you guys have summer reading lists or something like that, but wouldn't it be cooler if I just read to you? So, you can always check me out on Audible, audible.com. You can search up Mr. Creepypasta, and I have a whole bunch of books that I've done audiobooks for there, such as Tales from the Gas Station, or the very newest one that I've done, Pastel Colored Dreams and Human Flavored Nightmares by Vincent Venacava. If you haven't checked that out yet, uh, hot dang, you should.
And as always, I want to give a very special thanks to all of my patrons at patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta because you guys are the reasons I get to keep my lights on in the house and get wonderful little treats for my cats and everything like that. And also the reason why we keep getting special custom series just for the channel. So a special thanks to Jacob Schaefer, Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Brian Arst, Ken Lando Higuchi, Bobby Carmen, Tristan Pelton, Chase Burnett, Bardo Hawk 764, the Banana Mafia 1, Melancholy Corpse, Hollow Zero, Ferb, Harley, Billy Morrow, Katie Birch, Sashi Sasaku, Caden the Spooky Boy, My Body Sounds Like Rice Krispies, Ashwood, Lord of the Weebs, Jay, Faye Lockett, Miss Xandra, Mr. Unsettling Spaghetti, Eurogore, Suji Campbell, Marco Takes Dabs 420, Stricken, Ozreen Fox, Robert White, Andres Garcia, Snails Brennan, Legit Quad Feed, James Bruce, Chris Lovins, Freddy Krueger, Tynan, Justin Johnson, Michael Scarborough, Infernal One, James Lowe, Lisa Cottrell, Caspian, Jordan Nels, Hades Nephew, Tater Chip, Acid System, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society, Cryptic Nightmares, Someone You Love, Kira the Sloth, Tommy Green, Sky Harbor, Caleb Dougal, Nina Smith, Nico Kayo, Rafael Rodriguez, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Polson, Trace Miles, Corey Kenshin, and Peaceful buddha that's right guys at patreon.com slash mr creepypasta you could join this amazing list of people's names i mispronounce and the list of patreons down there in the description but of course none of that is ever required i just appreciate you guys subscribing and watching and honestly being here so to all of you sweet dreams <laughs> <laughs>